and welcome to Daily Debrief brought to you by People's Dispatch. I'm Pragya. Luis Fernando Camacho, who played a key role in the 2019 coup in Bolivia, has been arrested. However, his right-wing supporters are on the warpath in his stronghold, Santa Cruz. After appointing ambassadors in each other's countries, Colombia and Venezuela have reopened a border road to commercial and private traffic. And finally, Japan's relations with Russia soured last year after it imposed sanctions on the latter once the war in Ukraine began. Now, a top Russian official has said Japan's fast-tracked militarization is bad news. All this and more in today's episode. The latest reports from Bolivia, Santa Cruz province say right-wing leader Luis Camacho's supporters have blockaded many parts of Santa Cruz. There were violent crashes after Camacho, who is from Santa Cruz and its governor, was arrested and sent to four months of pre-trial detention. The Luis Arque government has been trying to ensure accountability for a 2019 coup attempt in which over three dozen people died. Last year, right-wing former President Janine Arnaz was sentenced to 10 years for her role in toppling the Evo Morales government. We spoke to Zoe from People's Dispatch, who has been following the developments. Okay, Zoe, thanks for joining us. Uh, you've been uh, jet-setting around and we're catching you, I think, when you're still a bit jet-lagged. Zoe, about Luis uh, Fernando Camacho, now so much violence happening because of his arrest. Can you give us a little bit of the background, the context, and also why it's happening in Santa Cruz? Definitely. So on December 28th, a far-right leader and governor of the Santa Cruz province in Bolivia, Luis Fernando Camacho, was arrested uh, as part of an ongoing investigation by Bolivian prosecutors about the Culeta 1 case. Um, and so essentially what's going on is that uh, following the restoration of democracy that happened in uh, October and November of 2020, when Luis Arce and the movement uh, towards socialism party won the elections uh, and defeating really um, the coup government that was led by Janine Añez, a process began to essentially bring those to justice who had carried out this coup against the democratically elected government of Evo Morales, um, to bring those to justice who carried out this coup, who really instigated this coup, and then later on actually participated in a lot of the violence against the civilian population. Uh, just to remind people that 38 people, uh, according to human rights organizations in the country, 38 people were killed uh, in the violence by security forces um, who uh, against protesters who were demanding the return of Evo and demanding return to democracy. So it's a it's a really harrowing situation that happened there. Um, and people have been demanding, of course, they at the time were demanding return to uh, democracy. Now that democracy has been restored, there's been a very strong movement, especially amongst the victims, to demand that people be brought to justice for these crimes that were carried out. So in this context, we have to understand the arrest of Luis Fernando Camacho and to understand that the, the Santa Cruz Department uh, province was really one of the most active in this um, violence that really brought about the coup d'etat. It's an area where there's a lot of far-right groups who are very active and organized, organized with a lot of the um, business owners. It's an area that has a lot of industrial development and uh, a really strong right wing. It has to be said, a strong right wing that is organized, um, that does not like the socialist government, despite the fact that they even themselves have seen um, economic growth under these uh, governments of the Mas Party. Um, and Luis Fernando Camacho is really the leader of these different groups. And so the fact that, you know, after two years uh, since democracy was restored, he's finally um, arrested, was actually celebrated by most people because they saw the destructive role that he had played in this process. Um, calling for mobilizations against Evo, saying that the elections that happened in 2019 were fraudulent, um, calling on Evo to resign. Um, and so for many, this was a welcome arrest. But of course, in Santa Cruz, where I said there are these organized right groups where he is seen as the leader, and of course, he was elected as governor, has to be said, um, people were very angry. And it really responds to their general uh, anger that, of course, their coup d'etat was unsuccessful. It was successful for one year, but since then they have been defeated at the polls by the people. Um, but they want to continue this violence. They want to destabilize the government. And so since December 28th, when he was arrested, and then, of course, two days later, he was sentenced to four months 
in prison and preventative detention, there has been mass uh, riots, violent riots, really, um, in Santa Cruz. Uh, public buildings have been burned. Um, people have been attacked. There's been, you know, a send. Uh, violent uh, unrest that's been unfolding, um, demanding for him to be released, saying that he's been kidnapped. Uh, and it's it's quite uh, worrying because the situation is, uh, as of now, contained to Santa Cruz. But, you know, they're causing massive property damage to different institutions of the state. They're attacking police officers. Um, so it's quite worrying. And it's unclear, you know, now that he's been sentenced for four months, do they plan to continue for the four months? As of now, they have been mobilizing continuously. As we know, in the end of last year as well, they carried out a national strike against the census. Um, so they're mobilized, they're continuing to destabilize, and that's that's kind of the update on that situation. Right. So, you know, we also read some reports here where people have started saying that, look, you know, this kind of unrest is terrible for business, it's terrible for whatever work we have to do, etc. How is the case uh, against Kamacho likely to proceed in the coming weeks? What do you see happening next? Well, I think we can maybe look at uh, the Kuleta 2 case in which Janine Anyas um, has been convicted and sentenced um, to prison. Uh, there's a lot of clear evidence that implicates all of these different individuals in the acts that they carried out. I think the fact that they waited, you know, two years, uh, they've been collecting evidence against Luis Fernando Camacho. They actually summoned him to come to La Paz to give a testimony four different times, and he evaded this, these summons, which, of course, is what actually led to his arrest. Um, and so I think we're in the next couple of months, they're going to continue collecting evidence, continue building the case. Eventually, when it goes to trial, I don't see uh, any reason why he wouldn't be convicted because there's, you know, video evidence. A lot of people have seen this where he called for violence um, against against different people of the mass party. He also uh, admitted that they you know, uh, colluded uh, to bring about this coup. There's so much different evidence against him. So I, I, the most likely is that he does get convicted of this crime. Um, how this will impact these mobilizations, it's unclear. I think they're likely to continue mobilizing. And of course, uh, a conviction in trial would definitely bring about more unrest. Um, but I think the, the Bolivian justice system is committed to giving justice to the victims, to recognizing and to punishing those who were responsible for this horrible subversion of democracy and what led to uh, so many different human rights violations. Right, Zoe, and thanks a lot for that uh, very detailed update. Thanks a lot. A road reopened in September and now, after years, a shared border route has also reopened. Ever since Colombia's Gustavo Petro came to power, ties with Venezuela have been improving steadily. This is big news for a region where Colombia was used as a proxy for conflict with Venezuela all these years. What is its significance? We go back to Zoe. Zoe, Colombia and Venezuela are opening up this border road. This was announced earlier, now it's happened. Can you talk about the relevance, why it's happening now, and uh, what could be the benefits from this road? Well, this is uh, a huge advancement in uh, Colombian and Venezuelan bilateral relations. It might sound like a small thing that this road has opened up, but I think if we look at the, the history of, of this region, of this border region over the past um, decade, it's been a region where there's been a lot of unrest, um, where it's been kind of the flashpoint of um, worsening tensions between the two countries. As we know, uh, Colombia during the past well, of course, six decades has been ruled by conservative leaders. But in the past decade, during this attack from the United States on Venezuela, Colombia has been a sort of willing partner and at its own uh, detriment and at its own, uh, you know, not benefit because it is a country that has very, very close relations to Venezuela. Uh, at one point, there were four million Colombian refugees in Venezuela, uh, you know, internally, just uh, people who were displaced from the armed conflict in Colombia have fled to Venezuela. So there's a very, very intimate links between the two countries, um, many different regions that really, uh, you know, are a continuation of one another. Um, these countries used to be one. Um, so the fact that during um, the you know, U.S. induced crisis in Venezuela, in many ways, Colombia started to take a very hostile position against Venezuela. Um, this led to the border closing between the two countries. And essentially, uh, no cars had actually passed between this border for, since 2015, completely closed. 
the only way to get from one place to another was really uh, by plane or crossing the border illegally. And this is ridiculous, given the fact, again, that they're neighbors. Um, so now with the opening up of relations that we've seen with the government of uh, Gustavo Petro in Colombia is such an advance. They've made so many different advances in many areas in retaking um, commercial ties, uh, in cultural exchanges happened between the two countries, um, concessions by Colombia, for example, businesses that had been usurped by uh, the the fake government of Juan Guaido have been given back uh, to the to the rightful and constitutional government of Venezuela. And now this opening of the border is really is really something that will help the people of the two countries. Um, the crossing between Norte Santander and Táchira is just a natural crossing where people, you know, maybe go to work go shopping in two areas, have family on both sides of the border. This is, of course, a huge, huge advance in, in humanitarian means. Um, and hopefully it marks the continuation of bettering of relations between the two countries that, of course, are intrinsically linked. Um, and I think it, it's a really good sign in the fact that uh, Colum both Colombia and Venezuela are making good on this commitment to bettering their relationship um, and to making life a lot easier for those people who live in that border area. Right, so a little bit more detail would be really great on how it's going to improve tries in the region. Definitely. Uh, this, of course, is taking place at a moment where uh, the regional map politically is, of course, towards uh, progressive leaders. We, we saw, of course, with the victory of Gustavo Petro in Colombia in June, that a country that had been ruled, as I said, for six decades by conservative governments, anti-people governments, uh, this was reversed with the election of Gustavo Petro. Uh, and now in, in October, with the victory of Lula da Silva of the Workers' Party, is another huge step forward for the region. Now we can say that the majority of the region of Latin America and the Caribbean is ruled uh, by progressive leaders. Uh, this means for example, I think if we're looking at 2017 when Venezuela was in its most critical point uh, with the harshest sanctions being imposed, uh, a massive decline in their GDP, it was surrounded by enemies. It was surrounded by countries that said that it did not have a right to exist, that it was an illegitimate government, um, that drastic, drastic measures had to be taken uh, against the country. And now we're seeing that Venezuela is actually given a little more space to breathe and that the you know which is why it can't be understated the the fact that uh petro's government has retaken diplomatic commercial relationships uh with venezuela recognizing the rightful government nicolas maduro and now uh lula da silva was sworn in on january 1st and he also has made a commitment to retaking the relationship um with the constitutional government of nicolas maduro there was a very emotional um, ceremony that took place at the Venezuelan embassy in Brasilia. And just to remind people that during uh, the attempt to overthrow the government of Nicolas Maduro, many embassies across the world of Venezuela were under attack. And one of those was the embassy of, in Brasilia of, the, of Venezuela. This was constantly under attack by um, fascist forces who wanted to take over the embassy. And it was the movements of Brazil that actually defended this embassy and made sure that they did not uh, actually gain control over the embassy. And so now uh, with the return of Lula da Silva, there was a visit by the uh, Venezuelan government delegation uh, to visit it, to thank the Brazilian social movements for actually having protected this embassy and to mark that there's a new there's a new moment in, in the relationship uh, between the two countries, that they will be resuming their diplomatic and commercial ties. And again, neighboring countries that have so much in common where there's just natural uh, interaction that has to happen. And so I think we can see definitely with this new progressive wave, it definitely marks a new moment for Venezuela, a moment where it can actually have normal relationships with its neighbors, where it's not one of antagonism and one of attacks. Right, Zoe, thanks a lot for joining us with that update. Thanks so much for having me. Relations between Japan and Russia have worsened since the start of the Ukraine war last year. Japan is one of the few countries which joined the West in imposing sanctions on Russia. Now Russia's Deputy Foreign Minister for Asian Affairs has told the state-owned TASS news agency it will take countermeasures to Japan abandoning peaceful development. A peace treaty has become impossible to discuss, Andre Rudenko said. Anish from People's Dispatch has been following the developments. Let's go over to him. Hi Anish, uh, good to have you back on the show. 
So Anish, uh, can we talk about Andrei Rudenko's statements? What is the context for them and also why this discussion on a peace treaty? Yeah, so uh, the immediate context is obviously uh, the recent uh, defense documents and the defense budget that Japan has unveiled uh, last month, uh, which actually expands uh, the entire budget uh, to uh, about 2% of the national GDP or more than uh, nearly 40% of the national budget by the end of 2027, a five-year plan of sorts. And uh, this has been uh, widely condemned, not just by Russia, but also other neighbors of Japan, including uh, China and South Korea, uh, for not only uh, pushing for militarization, but also for, uh, you know, adding and reinforcing its uh, claims over disputed territories, uh, which are yet to be settled uh, with countries like South Korea and also Russia. Now, uh, this is where we need to talk also about the peace treaty of the... Uh, so Russia and Japan had uh, declared cessation of the state of war in 1956, uh, with a joint agreement, and in the, with that, uh, they had begun a peace, uh, peace uh, talks for peace treaty, negotiation for peace treaty that is yet to, uh, you know, come to a conclusion. And uh, this is important because we are also talking about territorial, not only territorial disputes, but also about crimes committed by Japan and how uh, the Soviet Union then and its successor now Russia. Uh, uh, considers these, uh, you know, historical uh, uh, events uh, that Jap or you know historical crimes that uh, Japan had committed in the region itself, and so in that the biggest block blockade has been uh, the Kuril Islands or the southern Kuril Islands, very specifically, uh, which Japan claims as its northern ter territories, and that has always been the biggest contention. Obviously, the dispute is more than a century old. But obviously, uh, Japan right now reinforcing its claims on these islands, along with other disputed territories in the region, shows that uh, there is a certain uh, tendency within the Japanese government right now that is not uh, looking for negotiations. Uh, and, that, uh, and while uh, the peace treaty itself, the talks uh, for the peace treaty, uh, kind of has been uh, in a limbo since last year in March, when Japan imposed sanctions on Russia, uh, the fact that uh, Russia is now saying that it is impossible to even have any kind of talks right now uh, shows that there is it has reached a point of no return at this point, uh, where uh, the Japanese and the Russian delegates cannot come together, sit uh, and talk uh, and resolve these issues, uh, these uh, outstanding issues between the two countries. Right, Anish. Anish, is this actually a very surprising development? The last few months have seen a fair number of like exchanges between the two countries. Can you just give us an idea of how this could pan out uh, perhaps in the future, in the immediate future? Well, obviously, uh, in the immediate future, or like what is happening even right now, we are looking at realignment or alignment, uh, so to say, of uh, certain forces, kind of like drawing out the battle lines in many ways, because along with uh, the, the statement that Rudenko made about uh, you know the impossibility of uh, not having uh, any kind of peace treaty with Japan, uh, is all, it also goes along with another statement that he made, which is uh, the reinforcing of Russian recognition of Chinese, China's, uh, you know, the one China policy, but also Chinese sovereignty over Taiwan. Now, obviously, we have also talked about this uh, multiple times, uh, but Russia is one of those countries that, along with more, more than 190 countries around the world, that actually recognize uh, Chinese sovereignty, at least on paper, on Taiwan. Uh, this makes it, uh, you know, this comes at a time when anti-China aggression has is now at its zenith right now. Uh, with Japan and South Korea lining up along with Taiwan and the United States, to go up against China in many ways. Uh, and okay. that is, obviously, this shows that there is sort of like a, a sort of battle line, if diplomatic battle lines at least, being drawn up uh, between two forces right now. And so, obviously, that is one part of the issue. The other fact is that, uh, you know, uh, 
any kind of tensions between Russia or any kind of tensions that would include Russia can only have problems in the near future because obviously uh, bringing up the whole Coral Islands dispute can become a bigger problem. Uh, we are talking about a dispute that should have been settled decades ago, uh, decades more than more than uh, three quarters of a century ago, actually. But uh, this is not something that uh, that the Russian and the Japanese uh, governments right now need another dispute in a region that is not known for an armed conflict in the in, you know since the Second World War. Uh, so de definitely, we need to uh, be more concerned about uh, these developments where uh, a supposed European or a Eurasian, another Eurasian power is being dragged into a dispute. With the United, uh, where the United States is trying to uh, make hay out of uh, out of the situation right now. So obviously, these factors will collide uh, over the uh, the next uh, couple of months. Maybe over the year, over this year, we can actually see bigger tensions, uh, more provocations from all sides, and that is only a more concerning part of this because we're talking about some of the biggest armies and economies in the world right now uh, being in tensions with each other and that is not a good news for anybody right anisha and thanks a lot for joining us and that's all we have for you today thank you for watching daily debrief do come back to us tomorrow for more such stories visit our website peoplesdispatch.org and you can look up our regular updates on facebook twitter and instagram